Hey everyone, this is Yvette Hampton. Welcome back to the Schoolhouse Rocked podcast. I am so glad that you came back with me today. We are talking with Dr. Mark Hamby and he is telling us a story about learning how to be a shepherd to real sheep, but more importantly to his family. And so I hope you're enjoying this week um, and just being encouraged and filled up with God's truth and with what the Lord has done through uh, Dr. Hamby and his family. But before we get back into the conversation, I want to say thank you to our sponsor, BJU Press Homeschool. Do you want help managing your homeschool day on a day-to-day basis? BJU Press has a new homeschool hub that can dramatically simplify things for you. You'll be able to see your child's workload, document grades, modify schedules, and more. The BJU Press Homeschool Hub is the resource you need for painless planning and happy homeschooling. Visit BJUPressHomeschool.com to see how the hub can change your homeschooling. Well, Dr. Hamby, um, you ended yesterday's episode with one of the most disgusting stories I've ever heard in my whole entire life. Those who know me know that I like going to the zoo. I love looking at animals from the other side of the fence, but I am not an animal person. I am definitely not a pet person, though we do now have a pet fish in our home and I'm okay with that because the fish doesn't bother me. But that's about the extent that I will go to, to have an animal in my home. Uh, but yeah, so, so that story, if you guys missed it, you've got to go back and listen to it because it is one of the funniest and most disgusting things you'll ever hear. Um, but, but continue on with the story. Cause you're talking about how you just kind of redeemed yourself in the eyes of your daughter and saving these little lambs. Yeah. And then the vet, um, you know, once my sheep started following me, then I realized that that is the key to reaching the heart of our children and our spouse. You know, if, if, if sheep can turn from hating you to following you, all because you're willing to get dirty, that, see, that's what Jesus did on the cross. We don't obey Jesus because he told us to obey. We obey Jesus because he died on a cross. Um, because he outstretched his arms out and took our sin on himself. He who knew no sin became sin for us. And so when when Jesus became dirty for us, he was demonstrating how much he loved us. And that's attractive. You know, when, when someone loves you that much and they're willing to take dirt on themselves, your dirt on themselves, that's the key to parenting. You know, it's not always about authority. It's not always about discipline and punishment. Um, a correction. And those things are important. But if your kids don't see the other side of God, then they're only going to see God as a judge. And, um, you know, God's mercy is to a thousand generations. His judgment is to the third and fourth, to them who keep his commandments. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, our, our kids need to see that imbalance of God's mercy and judgment. Um, it's a thousand to four. And his grace is sufficient. His grace is made perfect, you know, in our weakness, not our strength. Yeah. Um, come boldly to the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy to find grace to help in the nick of time. And so that's what parents need more than anything. They need to parent with grace. Um, they also need to parent with correction. Um, that's mm-hmm. a vital part of, of child training. Um, and so I, I came across this verse around that same time. I was sitting in the barn right around the time when this lamb was, you know, saved. You know, not saved selfifically, but saved <laughs> physically. Um, and Jennifer, you know, saw what I did. And, you know, then then I saw what I did, you know, that that made a significant difference in this, in my 70 sheep. And I'm thinking like, well, if it had this effect on my sheep, will it have the same effect on my family? And sure enough, it does. And I came across this verse in um, Isaiah 40, 11. It says, he tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms. He carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. I read it over and over and over again because I had always been trying to get a little lamb on my shoulders. And they won't let you do that. Not easily. And if you try to do it, you got to be really careful. Their little hoofs are like razor blade sharp. And you can get your juggler cut. I mean, this is serious stuff. You don't want to put a newborn lamb on your shoulders or even a two, three, four week one old, week old lamb. And, um, you know, maybe a two month old lamb, but not these little ones. And this verse says he tends his flock like a shepherd. So was I tending my flock like a shepherd? Well, what is a, what is a, what does a shepherd look like when he's tending his flock? And it says this, 
he gathers the lambs in his arms. And I'm like, okay, let's try it. I picked a little lamb up. I put the little lamb in my arms. Next verse says, part of the verse says, he carries them close to his heart. And I thought, I'm going to try it. I put the little lamb who was fidgety in my arms. I put his head next to my heart. And guess what happened? He got completely still. Yeah. Just completely still. Do you know why? He was hearing the beating of my heart. Mm -hmm. And I thought, whoa, this is incredible. That's what my kids are missing. They're hearing the beating of my voice, not the beating of my heart. And that's all Jonathan needed. And, and Yvette, immediately, I started to change my parenting style. And it wasn't, I was no longer going to correct him and discipline and punish him based on what he said. He's now 15 years old. I, I'm now going to empty the reservoir of hurt because the way he empties it is by what he says. That's his way of expressing his hurt are through his words. And so I'm not going to jump on his words anymore. I'm not going to get into a war of words. I'm going to let him empty that reservoir of hurt out. And then I'm going to try to reach him through the beating of my heart rather than through the forceful beating of my voice. And it was astonishing to see the results. The very first thing that happened, I'll never forget, it was like that next week. I came home and he was in trouble again. And Debbie wanted, Debbie thought I needed to discipline him. He was playing the piano and I went over and I'm going like, Jonathan, you know something? I love listening to you play the piano. It is amazing. You, God has given you such a gift. I said, it brings so much peace into my heart. I said, thank you for taking time to play like you do. And he looked at me and he like, he knew he was in trouble. And he looked at me, <laughs> he goes like, seriously? I said, yeah, that's, thank you. It's, um, I really appreciate the gift that you got. He goes, he, looked, he really said this, he, just to be smart. He goes, did you just get saved? <laughs> 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 if he had said that, you know, I would have smashed him. But and then, that's funny. And then I thought, well, God's given him this gift. Well, let's do something about it. I went and I went to um, an engineer at a recording studio. And I said, hey, look, at my son's really good in the piano. I, I want to just pay for this night. Can I? Can we spend two hours here and you record him? And he goes, sure. So I went down. I said, Jonathan, we're gonna we're gonna go out and have a dad night, father and son night. And he goes, where are we going? I said, surprise. So I I take him to the studio. And now listen, he's really good. He's actually got four albums out. Wow. Uh, and uh, and so I take him to the studio. In fact, the first album happened on this night. He wasn't intending to do an album. He was just gonna go play, just for fun. And it was a studio that had, guess whose piano? He, they had Abraham Lincoln's piano in the studio. Oh, wow. It was so <laughs> cool. Probably wasn't the greatest tuned piano, but it was Abraham Lincoln's, you know? And yeah, so it cool. was a big deal, you know, for Jonathan to play, you know, behind Abraham Lincoln's piano. And, and, uh, and so he's playing, and I, I, I look up at the engineer, and Jonathan starts playing. And the engineer looks at me, and I'm going, like, record this. And he starts recording. Jonathan doesn't know he's being recorded. He played for an hour, in probably hour and 15 minutes, nonstop, it was in, in, in flawless. There wasn't one problem in any of it, and it turned into be an album. And it, when he was done, last song, he's playing, and he looks up, and I'm, I'm behind the glass wall. He looks up at me, and he's looking for, guess what? Affirmation. Your approval. Yeah. And... I look at him and I just give him a thumbs up and he smiles and he plays this ending that he's never played before. It was brand new. He'd never even thought of it before. It just came to him spontaneously. And, uh, and, he, and he puts this song as the ending song in the album. And it was a result of parenting with grace for the first time. We want to thank all of our sponsors for making this show possible. BJU Press Homeschool, CTC Math, Apologia, and IEW. Without them, we wouldn't be able to do this. Visit the show notes for links to these great companies and thank them for supporting the Schoolhouse Rocked podcast. So that happened. And then uh, we started going to conferences, homeschool conferences together. And, and uh, you know, this one conference, <laughs> you know, it was really crazy. He... Um, he wants to get, we're in Tennessee and he wants to get back. It's like a 12 hour drive. He wants to get back yeah. to church the next day. 
And I'm like, Jonathan, this is a killer, you know? So we drive through the night and we make it for church in the morning. I haven't slept at all. He slept for maybe three or four hours. And, uh, and so we're sitting in this Baptist church where we go to and, you know, it's packed house. He's on the end. So it's me, Debbie, Jennifer, David, Jonathan. And he's sitting there sprawled out, laying down practically, no Bible in his hands. <laughs> and so I wrote, I wrote him this note, Jonathan, your posture looks tired. Please sit up and look attentive in God's house. Use mom's Bible. Thanks for listening to my instruction. Manhood lesson number one, a will to obey. Love dad. This is for your own good. I really wrote that note. <laughs> so, so via Jonathan comes a note that he writes out to David, Jennifer, Debbie, to me. And this is what it said. Dad, I'm tired. I slept for four hours. Instead of always finding some way to instruct me, let me listen and understand in peace. Thanks, Jonathan, trying to help. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to kill this kid. This kid doesn't listen to anybody, you know? And, and so this is like, of course, all this beautiful grace stuff's been happening in, in my relationship with him. But all of a sudden, you know, when I'm extremely tired, I've lost it all, you know, and I'm like, I'm going to kill him, you know? And so, so I wrote a note in Yvette and those that are listening, listen, no apologies. And I can't even believe I wrote this. It's embarrassing for me to even read this, but I'm going to read it. 24 years ago, this is what I wrote. Jonathan, I'd love to be sensitive to your tiredness, but someday you're going to stand before the living God and give an account of your refusal to listen to my instruction. Like it or not, God has given me the responsibility to instruct you. Whether you listen or not is up to you. Just remember, refusal to listen places you outside the blessing protection of God. Inside brings blessing and long life. Outside brings judgment and short life. Dad, <laughs> I, tell you, <laughs> I tell you. What a, what a, wow. How, how, how could a parent be like that, really? <laughs> I was, though. <laughs> I'm not like, and did he write you back? What's, oh, yeah, here comes the next letter. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Dear Dad, I did sit up. I'm not refusing to listen, and I'm tired of you getting on my case. You actually wonder why I don't like sitting with you. Come on, I'm totally exhausted. I'm doing my best just to stay awake, okay? And he writes, Jonathan, and then he writes, listening and obeying, for there's no other way. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm like, I leaned over to look at him, and I was ready to say, like, you sit up right now or else, right? But instead, God gets involved in the whole thing. And this is what I hear, not audibly, but this is what I hear in my heart. He's in my house, not yours. Oh. And I'm like, okay, I get the message. And I leaned over and looked at Jonathan and I said, I'm so sorry. And he started laughing like a hyena and just <laughs> laughing and laughing. And he couldn't stop laughing. And then I couldn't stop laughing. And the two of us are laughing our head off and then Debbie starts laughing, then Jennifer starts laughing, and David starts laughing. And the reason oh five of us started laughing in a Baptist church <laughs> while the pa pastor's preaching, which he's like, I can't believe you're doing this. We could, and the reason that the five of us laugh like that is because the five of us desperately needed healing from yeah. all of the turmoil going on in our home. And that laughter was like medicine. We laughed walking through the church. It was the best time we've ever had in church. Wow. We laughed going to the car. We laughed while we're in the car. We laughed for 10 minutes all the way home. And even mm. when we're walking to the door of our house, we're still laughing, crying, laughing. And we just started to feel God's redemption, just wow. filling and warming our hearts. Wow. And, I, and I wrote him a letter that night. And I said, Jonathan, I've been doing some soul searching lately and believe that I've not been a good father to you, but recognize that by God's grace, it's never too late. I'm truly sorry for the pain I've caused you. May God's spirit and your committed dad bring healing ointment to your life here. So every time I had this shoe oil sponge that I use for my leather shoes, it was always missing. It's because he was using it. <laughs> I was putting pressure on him. And I said, here's the shoe oil sponge. Use it whenever you want. Love dad. Ephesians 3.20. By the way, it was never out of place after that night. It was always where it was supposed to be after that. He wrote a letter and put it under my pillow that night and said, um, Dad, I, I've been doing some thinking of my own. I, too, am sorry for the pain I've caused you. And he underlined it. However, I disagree with you that you've not been a good father. It's just like we've had some rough spots, more like smooth spots on sandpaper. But who's looking? <laughs> And then he said, here's my tie, wear it whenever you want. When I, 
took my tinfoil <laughs> sponge away from him. He took a tie that I loved wearing away from me and he wrapped it around the ladder and he said, here, use it whenever you want. And then he quotes James one, two through three. And Yvette, the reason that I think that we struggle with our children and our spouses is because of the last verse of the Old Testament. It says that God wants to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers. And God says, if that doesn't happen, I'm going to smite the earth with a curse. The Old Testament closes out with the word curse, and the New Testament closes out, last sentence, with the word grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. The curse is like living under the influence of legalism. It's The curse is what happened in the garden. The serpent would now crawl on its belly. Eve would bring forth children with sorrow, and Adam would bring forth the fruit of the fields with sorrow. The word sorrow is the word for intensive labor. The curse is what happens when we live outside of God's grace and we try to make things happen on our own. It's literally living under the influence of the curse. The curse, just like the serpent would have to crawl, just like bringing children into the world without God's help, is going to take intensive labor. Bringing children into the world was a, was a demonstration, an illustration from God to us to tell us what it's like. It's going to be painful to raise our families without his help. But if we will do it with his help, then he will give us his favor and his grace, and he will be with us, and he will never leave us nor forsake us, and he will help us. Amen. So that's why he closes the Old Testament with curse, saying, like, if you want to do it your way, go ahead. But if you want to do it my way, then I will give you my grace. Because grace is demonstrated, unlike the serpent who crawls, showing us what intensive labor is like in the curse. Grace is demonstrated by outstretched arms. And that's what Jesus did on the cross. And when he did that, he says, I will draw, attract all men to myself. And that's what we need to do as parents. The greatest parenting posture is outstretched arms. When you have outstretched arms, you can't control anything. Yeah. When you have outstretched arms, you will draw your children to yourself and to the Lord. But you have to be prepared because outstretched arms is the position for crucifixion. And true grace always comes from and through a life that is willing to die to itself. Wow. Amen. Such a powerful story. You know, there is no greater privilege um, than being a parent on this side of heaven, I think, because being a parent teaches us so many things about God, about his character. You know, we, we learn humility. We learn um, grace. Like you said, we learn God's grace in our lives. And then we learn how to extend that to our kids. And we learn God's love for us. You know, that's one of the things that I remember just as when my first daughter was born, realizing how deeply I loved her. And mm-hmm. that if I can love my child as deep, I mean, it, almost a painful love that mm-hmm. I had for her. Yeah. And if I can love my child that much, how much more God loves me. And so I truly think parenting is the greatest privilege on this earth that we will ever have because it molds and forms us into God, who God created us to be as his children, right? Amen. And um, so praise God for his word. I am so thankful for your testimony and for your willingness to share it with us this week. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, we have just a few minutes left. We're just about out of time, but very quickly, tell us, you you mentioned in, in uh, Monday's episode about the guild, the Lamplighter guilds that you have going on. Tell us very quickly what those are and how people can get involved in those. Yeah, when I was reading in First Kings, the Queen of Sheba came to visit Solomon and she was blown away, not just his wisdom, but the way his servants dressed, the way they ate, the foods they served. They're ascent to the house of the Lord. And I started to think, you know, in, in Exodus chapters 33 through 36, uh, wisdom is um, demonstrated through a high level of beauty and skillfulness. In fact, the word wisdom means skillful. Children are drawn to excellence. We are drawn to excellence. We, we love a beautiful mm-hmm. sunset. We love things that are made beautifully. It, there's, it does something to us. When you see a play acted out or a drama listened to, or a book well written, whatever it, whatever's done with excellent beauty, um, it it's, it draws us because that's who God is. God held nothing back in His creation, and so I started to think, what would happen if we actually educated our children in an environment like they did in the Renaissance period, 
Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci. And why aren't we producing these great artists anymore? Why aren't we producing the great artworks anymore? And I came across a man named uh, Makoto Fujimura. He, um, he does modern art, and I don't like modern art, but his modern art was different, and I was very attracted to it and learned later that he actually used real gold in his paintings. Wow. And, and he was asked why, and he said, well, God held nothing back, neither will I. And so I thought that's the same with everything we do with here at Lamplighter, the books that we print, the audio dramas. You know, I could do an audio drama for $30,000 and that'd be amazing. I could do that. But our audio dramas literally cost us between two hundred and fifty dollars and $500,000. They're wow. extremely expensive. You know, just to buy the, just to pay for actors sometimes costs around $100,000 yeah. just, just to do the actor. But we try to get actors from the greatest actors in the world because we want children, when they listen to a Lamplighter theater drama, we want the children to realize to think that this is better than watching TV because now they, yeah. their 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 imagination is is being okay. used rather than the imagination of Hollywood. And so, so what we decided is that we were going to bring teachers together. This was 13 years ago, in every area: culinary, script writing, voice acting, sound design, music engineering, um, horticulture, um, stage acting, theology. And so we, we brought all of these, these filmmaking, photography, brought all of these teachers together for one week during the summer, second week in July every year. And I wanted to see what would happen. What would happen if we brought all of these master teachers together who love Jesus and brought all these kids together from 16 to 90 years old, multi-generational, everyone together, and they actually one week would produce a film, a script, a, an audio drama, you name it, you know, culinary, beauty, you name it. And what would happen? That first week, we all thought we entered into Narnia. That's what it was like. <laughs> and so we knew it It was. It worked beyond our wildest expectations. Wow. Head of the second year, third year, fourth year, head of for 13 years, 13 years, well, for 10 years. And then I said, you know what? This needs to be a college. This needs to be a mm -hmm. collegiate program so that the students can not just do it for one week, but can do it for a whole year. And then we added a second year and this is our third year into the program, and it's doubled every year. We're up to 20 students, and we're looking at probably going to 40 students next semester. We don't want it to grow that much, but it's growing, and we bring teachers in from all over the country, sometimes the world, and Yvette, it is life-changing. This week, they're doing a mystery dinner theater, so we they, they're doing it for three weekends. Then we're doing a musical drama. We travel, we go to the Eastman School of Music, we go to climb Mount Mohonk, we, go, we just got back from the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. I'm oh trying to give them a taste of excellence in every area, not just excellence, but excellence in beauty, so that they will realize that they want to see, they need to now be partners with God. That's what Second Peter chapter 1 is all about. His divine, his divine promises, great and magnificent promises, have been given to us so that we become partners with God to escape the lustful corruptions in the world. One of the ways you escape the lustful corruptions that are in the world is by partnering with God and doing things that are yeah. eternal and beautiful and joyful so that you don't want to ever look back. You just keep moving forward and expanding the kingdom of God. And when you're around people that are committed to that 24-7, I mean, there's no turning back. And so we're, um, we're in the middle of it here and... Um, People can go to lamplighter.net, look for it, or themastersguild.com and look at it. It is, it is better than college. We hold nothing back. We, we, um, we're just enjoying what God's allowed us to do. It's been a dream come true. It is, um, the mission is very simple. We're making ready a people prepared for the Lord, building inner character at least to career excellence by, ready for this, inspiring a renaissance of creative excellence so that people can know God intimately, proclaim Him passionately, and enjoy Him intimately. I love it. We will put links in the show notes to all of those things, to the Guild, to Lamplighter Ministries. Thank you guys so much. Have a great rest of your week, and we'll see you back here on Monday. Bye. Education is discipleship, and this is something I didn't understand until I was probably three years into homeschooling. The Bible teaches us in Luke 640 that when a student is fully trained, he will be like his teacher. And as we look around the culture right now, uh, I think it begs the question, who is teaching our children? 
who is teaching our children and what are they teaching our children. And to me, the benefit, the primary benefit of having my children home with me is I am able to impart my worldview to my children.